Spend less time searching and more time hauling loads with the Truck Stop Load Board. Find the right load at the right time to put more money in your pocket. Learn more today. Let the truck! You are listening to Why the Truck! Are you ready to track it? It's time for your Nooner with Tuner. Welcome to Wednesday. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. It's on Sirius XM's Road Dog Trucking Channel 146. Live right now across FreightWave social media or on demand on podcast players anywhere. Thanks for coming into the show. We got some awesome guests today, so I'm not going to spend too much time on the news today, but I do have to focus on a couple stories. Real big one coming up. This is uh, the 11th hour on this rail strike. Take a look at this headline. Rail contract talks continuing. Vancouver port acts ahead of possible stoppage. That right there. Yeah, there we go. Stuart Charles, he says, will contract negotiations to avert a possible Canadian rail shutdown were continuing. The busiest import container gateway was implementing measures to sustain cargo flows in the event of this work stoppage that may happen tomorrow. The Vancouver Fraser Port Authority said in a statement on Monday, we are concerned about the prospect of further labor disruptions impacting port and supply chain operations. The impact of the Port of Vancouver will be significant with approximately two thirds of all cargo volumes at the port moved by rail, including 90% of international exports. Canadian National Railway on Sunday formally notified Canada's Teamsters Union that it will begin locking out union employees at 12.01 a.m. on Thursday. That's about 12 hours from now, right? Maybe 13 if that's on West Coast time. Canadian Pacific Kansas City earlier issued its own lockout notice after the sides remained far apart following those weekend negotiations. The union issued its 72-hour strike warning to CPKC on Sunday. Contract negotiations have continued through the week. A CPKC spokesman said in an email Thursday, rail traffic could come to a halt Thursday, barring any last-minute developments, which I have not heard yet. The port says, we expect disruptions to the movement of containers, grain, potash, coal, and other cargo transports to and from terminals by rail. In the best interest of all Canadians, these matters need to be resolved immediately, and we urge all parties involved to come together and reach an agreement. The last strike lasted 13 days. It caused months of backlogs over there. There were vessels out at anchor. There was rerouting. It's a big mess. As of Tuesday, CPKC has embargoed all shipments originating in Canada, all shipments originating in the United States destined for Canada, and all carload traffic destined for the Canadian interchange. The company is communicating directly with customers as additional embargo goes in international terminal restrictions for temperature control containers and other intermodal containers are implemented as necessary. Sounds really serious. I asked an insider about this. They couldn't say anything publicly, but they said that they think the sooner the Canadian government steps in, the better for the railroads and the Teamsters. The only real winners right now are OTR Canadian truckers. So, hey, go OTR Canadian truckers. There's always one winner in a market. Um, I asked him how long he thinks it could last. He said no comment. That's ominous. Uh, Scott Shannon, he's C.H. Robinson's Canadian VP, said, now that a strike notice has been declared, some of our Canadian export customers are starting to ship time-sensitive goods to the ports by truck to avoid containers being stuck at rail terminals during the strike. Not good. How are you guys preparing? Have you done anything yet? Are you concerned about this? Leave a comment down there. Tesla semis, we've talked a lot about those. Another uh, brief news on here. Interstate 80 was shut down in Sierra, was shut down after a Tesla semi crash. The battery on that ignited, went on fire. Hazmat teams had to come around because of the toxic fumes that come from these lithium ion batteries. Uh, CBS News reported Interstate 80 is now open in both directions, though. Cal Fire says the big rig fire jammed traffic on both directions of I-80 stemmed from that Tesla semi. Officials declared that hazmat situation. Cal Fire Battalion Chief Nolan Hill said, when the electric vehicles start a thermal runaway process within the battery cells, it takes a very significant amount of water to start the cooling effect. It's very hard for us to access the those. KCRA reports Tony Orcozo, he's a manager at a cell station in Nyack. He said that hundreds of cars had to fill up his parking lot as they waited out that extended delay. He said it's kind of crazy because everyone was getting turned around right here. For the first hour or two, the parking lot got packed. Right, he's now back open. So good news on that. But look, there's only like 100 or less Tesla semis on the road. Now one of them's on fire. What's the failure rate on the other ones? We'll have to find out about that. One last thing here, least attractive. This came out. This was going crazy across the uh, Twitter sphere yesterday. Least attractive habits, hobbies, sorry, least attractive hobbies for men, according to women. Video games were 90 
They were up at the top of there as the least attractive hobby. They had collecting figurines, magic tricks, online trolling, gambling, building model trains, taxidermy, comic book collecting, and bird watching is the worst possible habits your male significant other could possibly have. I completely disagree with this. Any guy like 45 or under who was born with a Nintendo, you know, we know games just got better. We never gave it up. You're gonna have to deal with it, ladies. Although Allie doesn't want to. She says, the point of hobbies isn't to attract the opposite sex. You do you. Whatever it is, you find fun. But I don't think a lot of men fully internalize how women feel about video games. At the very least, leave it off your dating profile. Okay, that's good advice. Probably not something you want to lead with. Probably doesn't want to go in a ranked match Call of Duty with you. Caroline Mueller says, this is the worst list of hobbies I've ever seen. Yeah, women aren't that into online trolling, taxidermy, or comic books. That shouldn't come as a surprise. Try outdoorsy and physical activity hobbies. Everybody will be better off. Max Possible says, I'm screwed. I'm in the model train camp. There's some model train magazines now over at Fire Crown. Combat Group, shout out. Keith O'Brien says, where's Legos? That's, that's the most attractive on this. I would think so. I don't see it on there. You know, I got all the girls coming around. Just kidding, married. Ryan Van Brocklin says, guys that play with Legos are the super studs and the ladies don't want it known that they have a super stud. Must be why my wife keeps it quiet. Sarah Dan Dan says, online trolling is a hobby. Actually though, I see a lot here on LinkedIn, so maybe it is a hobby. I would agree, and Shimmy, Shimmy Munson, she's actually coming on here. She'll be on here on Friday with Lacey, another uh, lovely young lady. And we're gonna get into a really interesting topic. Speaking of LinkedIn, creeps in the LinkedIn DMs. There's been a big couple big situations that happened there. May not be naming names specifically, but we're gonna go deep on, uh, on you creeps. So watch out, you're a creep on LinkedIn. You're gonna borrow time, TikTok. TikTok. Shibby says, I feel like compared to this list, taxidermy is for sure not as high as it should be. However, at least it's a job. Also, personally, I find magic tricks pretty sweet. Yeah, got some magicians coming on the show as well. Uh, one more, a couple more little items here. I just got to get out. Purdue, there's rumors going on. I've confirmed that at least 30 drivers from one terminal have been let go from the fleet over at Purdue. And Universal Logistics, uh, someone said, we received an email from a broker we've been working with at Universal Logistics say they are shutting the brokerage as of Friday. I've heard a few rumors around that one as well. Looking for uh, confirm, may see an article on that soon. All right, it's absolutely Episode 749 of What the Truck. On the show, we're getting into the logistics of publishing a book. We got Theft of Fire author Devin Erickson. He's stopping by the studio to talk about his latest novel involving a deep space trucker, an intergalactic cargo heist. There's even a merch container in this damn thing. We'll find out what it's about and how to go from your next great idea to getting your novel on store shelves. And as an audio book, you can listen in your truck right now. Consolidation is happening fast in our transport. We got Beck Abdulev here, CEO at Super Dispatch. He's talking about how small companies are fighting back using tech against this rapidly consolidating market. And uh, how does hotshot trucking work? Diligent delivery systems, Richard Sharp, takes us to school and educates us on the 101 of expedited freight. Let's tip the band, man, and we'll get Devin up here. If you're ready to move more freight, make more money, and manage your freight business with speed and confidence, look to Truck Stop for tools that transform the way you move freight. Learn more at truckstop. You think those guys are your... But right now, let's welcome Devin Erickson, author of Theft of Fire on the Stage. Well, he's getting up here. Play that first clip. You think those guys are your friends? You have no idea what someone can do when they're tempted on this level. They'd sell us out in a heartbeat. Think of everything the Starlight Coalition does. Everything it makes, everything it owns. All of that technology came from looting one alien ruin. Think of what we could discover from a second one. Which of your so-called friends wouldn't so stab you in the back day, for that? We, we can stop Do you that know? Thank you. Can you be sure? Thank you. Devin, introduce Losers yourself, have please. Friends, Marcus. I am Devin Erickson, uh, retired engineer and science fiction author. And I've uh, I've just I'm working on the audiobook for my latest book, Theft of Fire. And we got a Kickstarter going for that. It's going very well. You do have a Kickstarter? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're doing a full cast audiobook. I'm directing it myself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan. So we were talking before you came on air and I, and we were getting a little bit into sort of logistics of audiobooks. And I was like, man, I love audiobiographies, but I only like them when the author actually reads it. And one disappointing thing I've seen recently is I got an audiobook and it was it was clearly read by AI. It was oh, so yeah. flat, the affect, no. there was no, no that's, emotion. That's terrible. It was terrible. That's that's terrible. And I think I think audiobooks are undergoing a transformation because, you know, back in the day, we used to call them books on tape. Yeah. And the idea was, oh, somebody's just going to read this book onto tape so you can listen to it. But there's so much missed opportunity there because, <clears throat> you know, it's a story. You want to dramatize it. And so I almost think that the future of audiobooks is going back to this kind of 
idea of like the 1930s, 1940s radio play where you have some sound, you have a cast of really professional, good actors. And that's what we're doing. I, mean, I, have, a, I have a cast of three actors who are playing all the three major characters and I'm directing it all myself. And we're, you know, sometimes doing like 10, 12, 14 takes per line just to get it absolutely right. Because I feel like that can be something where, you know, somebody's got to drive or whatever it is they're doing. You know, they can't they can't use their eyes to watch a show. Sure. They can't they can't read. But, you know, you can make it the full ex experience possible. You know why I got into them is we, we go and visit my family. My Both my wife and my family, they, the shortest distance to visit them is six hours, and the longest distance is over 12 hours going all the way up to the Northeast. And we were doing podcasts at first, and I love podcasts, but it gets annoying after a while having to go through like eight different podcasts just to make your trips. So I'm like, we need some books. We need something that's like 12 or 14 hours yeah. to really fill the space. And like, think about long-haul truck drivers, man. They got all they got is all the time in the world behind that wheel. Audiobooks are right at home inside the cab. Yeah, yeah, you got that certain part of your brain that's occupied and a certain part of your brain that's not occupied. And and that can be very tedious on long trips. Now, Devin, people who don't know, like I'm, I was looking at your little card right here uh -huh. and said, a mysterious Maersk orbital shipping container. What's this book all about? Well, I, I wanted to write an adventure in the near future, like when we've colonized the solar system. Yeah. And, you know, being an engineer and, you know, my dad was one of the chief engineers on the Voyager project. Those really? Those probes that went to the outer planets. Yeah. He, he took a lot of those pictures of the outer planets. So I was always excited about that. And I had this notion that, okay, someday we're going to go out there. So... Let's let's set a story in this future society where we've colonized the solar system. And what really occurred to me is that a lot of people right now, like with SpaceX and what have you, they're thinking about this in terms of entrepreneurs and guys starting rocket companies. But really what we're going to be doing in the next 100 years, if things go well, yeah. is we're going to be taking civilization, and this is something that's never been done before, we're going to be taking civilization and we're going to be exporting it to an entirely new location. And most people don't really, who live in civilization don't really know what it is. They don't understand that civilization is a whole bunch of infrastructure and a whole bunch of logistics that have to be actively maintained every day. Oh, sure. Most people have no clue how many steps have to happen so they can get their Starbucks latte and how many different types of professions and people have to be involved. So, but if you really look at it from this perspective, if you look at something like SpaceX, you realize SpaceX is a shipping company. Oh, sure. SpaceX, they take your, your freight and they're gonna move it from the gravity well to high orbit. That's what they do. And they're looking to expand to, okay, now we're gonna move your freight to Mars. Now we're going to move your freight to the asteroid belt so you can do your asteroid mining. And that is going to be the basis of humanity as a multiplanetary civilization. So I wanted to write an adventure with a character that kind of represented this entrepreneurial class yeah. that's creating these companies and a character that represented all of the blue collar logistics that have to exist to make that happen. Like, you know, belters who mine the asteroids and, you know, they, they ship freight around the solar system in this kind of, okay, you throw it in a, in a trajectory and then somebody catches it on the other end. And what is, what is the class interaction between these people going to look like? What is the logistics of how this civilization is maintained going to look like? And, you know, what, what happens when you have a civilization being very consciously built by these two groups of people. And I just thought that was a fascinating setting to put an adventure story in. I like that Maersk is still operating in this in this future now. Oh, of course they will. <laughs> Maersk, DCM, Hyundai, you know, Look, all of these companies will be out there. Sci-fi authors throughout history have written about things before they happen, whether it be the submarine, uh, George Orwell of 1984, yeah. we're currently living in it. Um, w when do you think this happens in your book? When are we in this sort of deep space logistics period that we could be, do we could be doing like heist with Maersk containers? Well, I deliberately left the dates a little bit vague because I didn't want the science fiction <laughs> nerds going, well, 
hell the planets line up at this date yeah. <laughs> you know so but 22nd century you know, I'm thinking 22nd century, and not 22nd century for us to get started, not 22nd century to get to Mars at all, but 22nd century where we're really, you know, a significant fraction of humanity is living outside Earth. We're moving freight all around the solar system. We're dredging gas planets to get methane and ammonia for our fertilizer and biologicals. We're growing our food out there hydroponically. All the things that you have to have to have an independent civilization outside the gravity well. Very interesting. Now, when you, the process of writing this book, now you had to think about the logistics, you had to think about the future. When you go to, mm -hmm. to write a book like this, you're, you're making the manuscript, how much like outlining do you do in advance for the world building? Ah, well, there's two types of writers. There's gardeners and architects. Mm. And the gardeners just like to plant seeds in the ground and watch what grows up. But when you're doing this kind of hard science fiction, and you can check my math, it all works. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're writing something like Theft of Fire and you're, you're doing all these orbital trajectories and everything, you really have to plan it out quite carefully. So I am an architect's architect. When I start a novel, I typically write about 25 to 35,000 words that the readers never see. Just all my notes, all my computations, all my outlines, and then you go through this multi-step process of refining your plans as you write. Because of course, anybody who works in logistics knows that a plan is a list of things that don't happen. Sure. <laughs> well, it, well, so here, this is interesting too. So you don't have like, I, like Harper or Collins or something behind this book. This is independently made. Independently Absolutely published. not. You have over yeah. 800 reviews on Amazon. So I've had mm -hmm. a lot of independent authors come on. They have like 10 reviews or yeah. less. And it's yeah. like, well, well, cool. You're getting a yeah. lot of tracks. So this has 800 yeah. reviews. That's real. How? What's the logistics behind that? How do you publish a book and how do you get it distributed to that market? Well, the first thing you need is, is to have a good product. Yeah. Where if you get it in front of somebody's eyes, they're going to love it and they're going to tell their friends. Then you need to get it in front of those eyeballs and you need to kind of find your own solution for that. Ours has been social media. We've been really successful talking about the novel. And we've also been, I've, I've done a lot of sort of columnist, opinionated, pol political nonfiction writing, which makes people, you know, they read this on social media, they read it on Substack. They say, hey, you know, this guy can write. Maybe I'll try out his book. Yeah. So. It's, it's about getting the word out there, but not just by saying, hey, I have a product you can buy. Everybody has a product you can buy. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's go fighting for your attention. They're all after you. You have to do something interesting that gives them value upfront for free that shows that you have value. So, you know, they're on social media. They're doing so. You entertain them. And it's like, oh, hey, this guy, this guy can actually do this. I'm going to check out his book. Very, very. So how many, like when you print the book, how many copies did you like in your initial run? How many, how do you print? How do you get that in stores? Okay. Well, usually, okay. So bookstores, physical bookstores yeah. are not our big market. I would think so. They're yeah, a little tough, right? bit, they're, well, they're a little bit obsolete. Yeah. You know, getting your book in bookstores and we are in some bookstores. We are starting to infiltrate Barnes and Noble in different locations. Well, and Amazon, but, of course. Oh, yeah. the world's well, biggest. Amazon, Amazon does print on demand. Yeah. So we don't actually have to do print runs. Oh, you order a book, they print it on demand. And you know, the margins are a little higher, but we still we make up for that by not having a publisher. Yeah. So we don't have somebody else taking a bite out of what we're making. So I'm a, I make a a a considerable amount more than per book sale than somebody who's who's uh, published through a publisher. Well, you don't have to buy like but, a thousand yeah. per per run. Oh yeah, you don't have to do you else? don't have to do what's called offset printing. Yeah. We do print on demand. I mean, we're looking into doing offset printing for some of the other sales we do, but that's sort of a money saving thing, not something we're dependent on. And you know, but the main reason I decided to go independent and, you know, I had publishing offers. I had publishing contract offers I turned down. Yeah. But we wanted to maintain full creative control. Of course. And 
you know, this is really going to come through in the audiobook, and we're we're looking at animation maybe in the future, but it's really going to come through in the audiobook because I had people offering me audiobook publishing contractors and contracts, and I said, okay, well, you know, I want to do full cast and I want to direct it myself, and they're like, what the hell are you talking what are you about? Talking about man, Who we're are not going to pay for that. <laughs> and I rolled up my sleeves and I said, all right then. I'll do it myself. Well, you've been doing pretty well at this marketing. So I have a let's show this video of him shooting the book with with a gun. This oh is yes, the most yes, yes. No, we were we were trying to dis debunk these uh, these rumors that uh, that oh you know the assassination attempt on yes. Trump is what happens you know, when we you should, hit. It, it couldn't have been a bullet that hit his ear because his ear would, would have exploded. So what we did was we got ourselves some pig ears. Yeah. And we're like, okay, this is what happens when you shoot something big and heavy, like a book that slows the bullet down and has energy transfer. And this is what happens when you shoot something light and thin, like a pig ear. You know, it turns out it just punches right through. Yeah. So, you know myth dispelled but we thought it would be fun to have our you know our bullet slowing object you know the the one that demonstrates when bullets do damage we thought it would be fun to use my book no it makes total sense yeah. I, I i love it too the, it, it kind of reminded me of that there was like that TikToker who put a book in front of his chest and had his yeah. girl shoot him with like a desert eagle and the dude died, obviously. Went well, he, Darwin, the instant explode. Darwin Award. Instant Darwin Award right there. Because, yes, a book will slow a bullet down, but it will, it will not. Don't do, don't do this at home, kids. It's, I'm what you call a professional. He's a professional <laughs> madman. Now, you got this Kickstarter going on. Show them the Kickstarter. How do they find this Kickstarter? How do they contribute to it? How do they get the audiobook? Ah, well, the they can pre-order the audiobook through Kickstarter. If you just go on Kickstarter and you search Theft of Fire, it'll come yeah. right up. Hell, if you just search Theft of Fire on Google, it'll come right up. You know, we've, we've been popular enough to make that happen. And we are delivering those through an outfit called Book Funnel, and that's very, very easy to use. It'll just it'll just show up when we're done. We've been we we took the risk of starting our recording in advance of starting the Kickstarter. Yeah. So we are about halfway done with the audiobook already. So we should be able to deliver very shortly. And that risk paid off because we've triple funded so far. So very people cool. people are invested and the the audio tracks we're laying down are really very special. My no. my actors are amazing. I have a few gifts from the WTTgear.com store for, for you and your accompaniment. I know you have your heart set home. You're thinking about someone at home. So I got three hats for you. Oh, thank you. And I have three. Awesome. And I have three shirts. As I am well. going to put this hat on right now. Looks there amazing. we go. Yes. Look, there you go. Yeah. Devin, thank you so much. Everybody, Theft of Fire. Go on Amazon right now and get the hard copy. If you want to back this Kickstarter, you want that audio book, you want to listen to that while you're driving down the road, feeling like a deep space trucker, go to that Kickstarter. It'll be on Audible soon enough too, right? Yep. Very cool. Well, thank you so much. Oh, it's not going to be on Audible. I'm sorry. Oh, it'll be on the Kickstarter. Sorry, just got I guess back. not. Don't yeah. go to Audible. Audible, go to Audible doesn't believe that authors should be paid. Sorry, I didn't quite hear you. See, there, that's but, why that's why yeah. book guys have managers so they can they can yell from offset <laughs> yeah. and correct yeah. us when we say something yeah. wrong. But we we will be on Book Funnel. We will be on uh, Campfire. Campfire. We will be on uh, Libby, I believe. Libby. Yeah, bunch of other platforms. Well, you guys take care. Uh, my heart's with you and, and at home, and, and thank you so much thank for you. stopping by. Death to fire, everybody. Go get it. All right, what do we got over here? Meanwhile, let's take a look at this guy. Get in the home. Home. <laughs> Gotta love it, man. I wonder if women, if on that list of hobbies that women hate of men, I wonder if they hate the air horn. Sorry, ladies. Yet another one. Another L for me. Or maybe it's an L for you. I'm not the one missing out. All right, go to WTTgear.com. Go get some shirts. Go get some hats. Go get some crop tops for your honey. By the way, I got a little better price for my supplier, so I lowered the price in here. Shirts, 25 bucks. Hats, 28 bucks. Crop tops, 25 bucks. This thing I'm wearing right now is 60 degrees this morning in Chattanooga. This thing is soft as hell. This is 45 bucks. This is my zip up. We got some hoodies coming in the store soon enough, so... Get your ass over there and make it happen. Right now, it's Beck. He's the CEO over at Super Dispatch, man. Beck, how you doing? Doing great, man. Great to be on the show. <laughs> Thanks for having me. You still a kid at heart? You still do the air horn when you see a truck uh, or a train go by? Yeah. 
Yes, sir. I love. By the way, I was reading your background. So we uh, we've walked familiar footsteps. You were a two-time debate champion back in the day when I was in high school over at a uh, Catholic school back in Boston. I was uh, I did a little Lincoln Douglas debate myself, and I was a bit of a menace. Yes, sir. You know, I I, I had a crush on this girl, so I wanted really wanted to be on a team with her, which is how I got into it. Turns out I was pretty good at it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, man, tell me what, what super, super people have never heard about Super Dispatch before. What's the elevator pitch on you, on you guys? Yeah, for sure. Auto Transport, shout out to all the car haulers out there, all the brokers and companies in the automotive space. Auto Transport is a big industry. It's a 10 to $12 billion industry. Lots of us see these car haulers out there. This whole automotive ecosystem depends on this logistics layer. So all these cars have to move around, right? All, all the way from the factory to dealerships, to people, to salvage yards, to auction and all that stuff. So uh, somebody has to manage all that. Super Dispatch is a complete end-to-end -end shipping platform that has TMS systems for carriers, shippers and brokers, and a load board and a marketplace in the middle. So we've taken everything that it takes to move a car at scale, at high volume, and put it on a single digital automated platform and made it super easy for any company to transport cars. Fair. So let me ask you about this. So in the auto hauler space, is that as fragmented as like dry van trucking? Is it uh, mostly independent operators and a couple big guys at the top? Or, or what's sort of like the, the dynamic of that market? Oh, it's super fragmented. The companies are fragmented, lots of small haulers, tons of owner operators, only a handful of large fleets on the carrier side, but also tons of brokers as well. And that landscape is changing a ton. And the way the, the way the shippers are behaving is also changing, but it's super fragmented today. But one of the things I want to talk to you about is is, is how that's changing really fast. So how is that changing? I saw a news story recently. It was like five of the biggest car haulers were looking to do a big merger. And I know that in your space, that had everyone just a little bit nervous, just like we hear a massive trucking company is going to do a roll up. What's happening there? And how does that impact the smaller players? You know, you know, a lot of changes changes are happening. Uh, speaking of small players, I've been studying how long car haulers and owner operators are staying in business. Uh, prior to 2018, the uh, owner operator was in business for uh, 3.4 years on average. Uh, as of 2023, the owner operator is only in business 1.8 years. So half the time that they used to be in operation before. So the landscape is changing a ton. So I think the consolidation is happening not just on the carrier side, but also on the broker side as well. You've got a lot less companies. And if, as you have a lot less companies, there's a lot less leverage that you have. So these bigger companies are going to con uh, continue uh, raising the rates or grabbing more of the inventory, more of the shipping inventory. So I think that as a, as a smaller to mid-sized company, you kind of have to adapt. You can't really outwork a larger company, right? So you got to have some tech, you got to you got to change how you do business. So I think on the carrier side, it's actually not as bad. I think the big guys as big as they are, they're not going to be able to haul all the freight. Right? They so aren't. you see these guys as much as much business. I mean, they're really good at sales, they go out and land all these uh, contract freight, but they end up using sub haulers anyway. So I think there's still going to be a lot of business um, for smaller carriers, even as sub haulers. So how would, how would your tech keep me competitive? I mean, first of all, it's probably a lot like freight where the big guys already have all this tech so starting to become table stakes, but how does it help the smaller player here? And I, I, is it similar to that? Like, it, it, are you guys a little slow with tech like we are over here in general trucking and it, it, some of the companies are getting it, the bigger ones have all invested, but the smaller ones are really starting to fall further behind. You know, you might be shocked. Uh, car hauling tech, auto transport tech is a few years behind freight tech. Wow, All right. <laughs> <laughs> but because of the, because of the size, uh, it's the dynamics are a little bit a little bit different. So the way we help car haulers is historically, you know, car hauler has to do a lot. The smaller you are, you got to land business, you got to you know scrape all the load boards, find your loads, negotiate, book all these stuff, and verify things. There's lots of work. So we get we we take a lot of those headaches uh, out of the equation. We make it easy for carriers to find loads to book those loads without picking up the phone, uh, negotiating. We help connect carriers with direct shippers uh, so they don't have to depend on the load board so that loads are directly coming to them more and more over time. We're beginning to help bundles, bundle those loads for carriers so it makes it easy for them. At the end of the day, the goal is really technology should do all the manual stuff, all the headache, 
of putting loads together and, and, and getting paid and making sure everything is in order and, and, and compliance. Um, and then the hauling part, picking up cars and delivering cars is what we think carrier is really best at and should be focused on. So we, we try to take all that headache out of the equation so that the carrier can spend more time on the road making more money. What do you think the biggest risk is to the smaller auto hauler right now? Is it that lack of tech adoption? Oh man, that's a that's a hot topic. Uh, the, on one side, that's that. On the other side, it's the race to the bottom. I think um, the prices on the load boards. There's a, a massive mismatch in supply and demand in different times of the year. So the race to the bottom on the rates. Everybody shopping for lower rates, and then mm. some car haulers accepting some of the cheaper freight is really driving the prices down. I think the biggest risk car haulers historically face is having a pure dependency on on spot market alone on the on the load boards alone if you're not developing your own customer base and your own source of um business for your company it's going to be really hard for you to stay relevant because you're going to go up and down with the market and with the demand and with the volume on the load board but your expenses are going to stay steady right so i think that's the biggest risk for now but overall it's a pretty safe space because there, there aren't a lot of car haulers entering the space Right. A lot of new people aren't coming into the industry. So if you're good at this job and you can you can have a very successful business and make a ton of money as a carrier in car hauling. When, when rates that's, go that's up, it's not easy to get into it. When rate is it like tracking when rates go up, all of a sudden, like everyone starts getting a call hauler rack on the back of their hot shot or something. Everyone starts installing a trailer. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like that. Kind of like that. You know, like uh, there's lots of stories of like, oh, I heard you can make a ton of money. It's super easy. Oh. You know, um, TikTok and, videos, man. In fact, it's, it's yep. That's it. That's it. And then, you know, those guys, we see those guys come through, you know, they don't last very long. The, the reality hits them hard, you know, within yeah. the first couple of months. Wow, man. So, like, we're not that much different. Auto hauler and dry van sounds very, very similar in the challenges that we both face. Interesting to hear that you're a little bit further behind in the tech. But look, people who are like, hey, I want to I move forward a little bit. I want to stay competitive. How do they reach out to you guys? How do they get a demo? Yeah, man, we got a uh, superdispatch.com. You can find us in the App Store. Uh, on our website, carriers, brokers, shippers, uh, you can give us a call. You can sign up for a demo. Uh, we have free trials and the app, you know, the app, you can start using it for free. So whether you're a carrier, owner, operator, large fleet, broker or direct shipper, you can go to the website and sign up and get all the information. You can also see all the case studies about how the big companies are using Super Dispatch to make it easier to transport cars, as well as how the little carriers are using Super Dispatch to make it easier for them to stay in business. Beck, hey man, thank you so much. Have a great Wednesday. Thanks for telling, taking us a little bit into the auto hauler world. Appreciate your time today. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. Take it easy. All right, everybody. If you're ready to move more freight, make more money, and manage your freight business with speed and confidence, look to Truck Stop for tools that transform the way you move freight. Learn more at truckstop.com. Elsewhere. Big sign there says 10 foot two. A lot of debris as we go onto this bridge. What are we gonna come across? Ooh, he got peeled. He got peeled. How do you not see 10 foot two? How do you not see 10 foot two, sir? He's like, oh, my cab made it. See, his cab made it through. Not the trailer though, buddy. Not the trailer. Look at that curve on that bridge too. I, I'm starting to think there's like a depth perception issue in this business. I don't know. Hey, by the way, here's a video that'll cheer you up. Richard Sharp video. Let's play that one. Yeah. Good morning, my friends. Just want to say hello. Uh, wishing y'all well today. It's right in here in Houston. Uh, just want to encourage you to be present, to put forth good effort today. Uh, don't just be at the job. Do the job. Make a difference where you're at. Make a difference with your team. And I wish you a great day. Take care. Man, you gave me some cowbell. I'm going to give you a little cowbell back, Mr. Richard Sharp, operations manager at <laughs> Diligent Delivery Systems. Good seeing you, sir. You look good in that. What the truck show? Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. I finally thawed out from last week. <laughs> you finally thawed out. You know, you, you, you came by. I had Tim Perp. Firstly, I had a guest in studio. So sometimes at the end, it's like, oh, wait, I got to fill dead air for 10 minutes myself. But fortunately, I had a guest here and we got it done and we did a little sound check. Uh, well and, played. And, well played. And it was a good show. <laughs> Hey, man, I'm happy to have you on the show. Is it still raining over in Houston, or has it finally died down? Since that video is like nah, two weeks that old was now. a couple weeks ago. We, we've got the burn going right now. <laughs> so. Man, 
I was, hey, you, do, do you ever diligent? Do you guys do any, we were just talking about auto hauler stuff. You ever do any like hot shot auto haulers? Uh, we've, we've done it on arrangement. Uh, we'll find, you know, we'll find the right truck and help people however we can. What do you usually, what are you digging into these days? Like what, what are you typically uh, hooking up? Cause you do a lot of hot shot work. Yes. So really it runs the gamut. I mean, it can be everything from a, an envelope of legal documents to a trailer full of oil and gas valves, pipe. Uh, it's one of the fun things about the freight industry. Like I, I know, you know, is it's just a new thing every day and you're you're solving problems for your customers and you know just trying to get stuff from point a to b and sometimes c and d for them richard how does hot shotting work what's a little 101 on this because you know some you, you see it all different types sometimes it can be a regular semi truck sometimes you just see like a ford f-150 and it can look kind of janky that they're pulling something along how does <laughs> hot shotting work like what's the 101 so I like to describe it as it's on-demand delivery. Sometimes, you know, in freight, you know, you can schedule weeks out and, or set up routes and stuff. But a lot of what we do is we solve the immediate need. You've got, uh, you know, a piece that needs to get over to a, a painting or coating company or to get inspected. Um, you've got a set of important documents that needs to be delivered across town. So it really just runs the gamut, but it's just stuff that is more, let's get it done today so we can keep our customers moving. Um, and that's, I don't know, that's just what makes it fun to me. I mean, it's, it's good to have the stuff that you know in advance, but we like the, the constant shift and needing to know how to shift the loads on drivers and, okay, this person's on this side of town. Okay. Give them this load and it makes it fun. <laughs> Keep showing your toes for sure. But like, why would someone use a, like a hot shot versus just a regular semi truck, like a regular carrier? Why would you go hot shot? So a lot of times it's going to be time-based. They need it now. And it's like, when can you get the truck here? When can you get this over to the plant where, you know, the, the whole production shut down? I don't have time to wait for an LTL carrier or anybody. I need you to, to get up and go. And that's what we do. We take care of our customers by getting it there, getting it in a timely manner, and most of the time ahead of time. So um, it's just going to be, it's, there's just more of a sense of urgency in most cases. Um, other times, and this was an interesting one to me, we have a customer that was actually going and doing pickups from her customers herself. But the problem is she would end up in all these mini consultations each time she stopped. And her husband said, why don't you schedule a hotshot service to go up and pick up uh, the pieces at the different locations? And that way they're getting in and out. You're not getting sucked in. They bring the material back to the office and you can focus on what you need to focus on and she can handle the customer service and have a little more control over it instead of getting sucked in at 45 minutes at each stop. And the next thing you know, she's staying up till three in the morning uh, working on the projects for her customers. Richard, what are, what are some of the myths? Like when I, like a lot of, I follow a lot of over the road drivers. And sometimes when I put like a post a janky pic of like a, a freight, like a rate to strap work and they see a truck is pulling it, they have a lot of negative, they, they seem to think hotshot drivers are reckless. Dispel some myths here. What are the myths about hot shotting and tell us why they're wrong? Well, so I think a lot of it is, um, <laughs> some of it's self-inflicted, but what I like to, what I see is an entrepreneurial fire and spirit in the drivers. And that's been with every company I've been with in this industry. And that's what I appreciate. Uh, it's not fly by night in a lot of cases. It is people that are truly grinding it out. Uh, sometimes immigrants that have arrived in the country and this is their, they are trying to stake their claim in a dream. And that is what I find inspiring a lot about this industry. And you, and so you know, yes, there are going to be people that are bad actors that do give a, you know, bad name. Um, we're going to run legally all day long. Other people are going to live in that very dark gray area sometimes. Um, definitely not us. So I think there's a lot more professional in the, professionalism in the industry than it sometimes gets credit for. Uh, but I just, I tell you, I can't be more proud of our team. I cannot be more proud of our drivers because I know they're doing it right and they're doing it right every day.
Sure, sure, sure. And look, it's it's freight. There's bad actors all across the board that can give us a bad name, regardless of what we pull. But all we can do is our best in uh, in that category. Now you're over in Houston. You have you have you're not you're no stranger to hurricanes and terrible weather pouring through there. How, there's a predicted big hurricane season coming through. We're still waiting for a lot of them to materialize. How big of a role does hot shotting play during weather events? So it really, it runs the gamut, of course. Uh, one is we got to make sure that we operationally are prepared um, to handle without power, without computers, you know, pen and paper, phone calls. And with Hurricane Barrel that recently blew through, our team put that into action. And I am, again, just so proud of them because they did such a good job in, in serving our customers. Um, a lot of times if customers have been out of, without power, they've been closed for a, co a couple of days. Once they get back online, they are calling a hotshot to get their stuff delivered to their customers as quickly as possible because their customers are delayed on the production line sometimes. So it's a, it takes on another sense of urgency. Um, one of the funnier things was magically after the power was restored after about a week and a half, it's in some cases for people, well, then people needed to return these generators that just really weren't up to their expectations and they feel like they need a bigger generator. And so there's been a lot of going and picking up return goods. Oh, wow. For, for different companies, you know, and it's it's like, dude, the gas is still fresh in here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you gotta be careful moving those around. You don't you want know, to blow up. We're trying so to that's an a... aspect that, you know, pops up every once in a while. But really, it's it's getting equipment to people that need it, whether you're taking generators to different companies or, you know, just supplies. So, you know, it's just, it's filling the need for people. Well, Richard, it's starting to become, you know, Christmas is approaching. Six, like I said, it was 60 degrees here in Chattanooga. It's already fall. We're, you know, a few months away, like what, three months and a, and a handful of days or something until Christmas peak season leading up to that. September, uh, a little bit of October, November. What? How should people prepare for this peak season, especially if they're considering hot shot freight? You help fill in some gaps there. Well, I think as as much advance notice as people can give when it comes to deliveries and planning, that always helps. Uh, but mainly, it's it's just have your resources lined up. Diligent has a ton of resources available for our customers, not just hot shot. And so we step into that role to help with overflow warehousing and a number of different uh, solutions for our customers that do have that increased inventory and that do need, you know, cross stock and other services. You know, you, um, you like to promote fun at work. What are your keys to fun at work? How do you keep a positive environment over there at Diligent? Well, it really just comes down to choice and trying to make a difference where you're at. Um, a lot of people will sit and gripe about the environment my question is, what are you doing personally to change it? You know, a lot of it is be the solution that, that you want to see, you know, and, you know, the famous saying, if, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So, you know, is there a magic formula that works every place? No, but caring for people. Uh, we have a member of my team that's celebrating 11 years with the company today. So we've recognized him. We, you know, had some breakfast tacos. Some of the ladies brought in cookies. I mean, it's just, you know, we're, we're trying to do those little things like remembering, hey, they worked here 11 years. Let's thank them for that, because that is that is a big deal. Another associate's birthday is this Friday. And we're actually having another appreciation event on Friday for the, the whole team here in Houston. So it's uh, but really, it just comes down to making a choice. Uh, it's. A person told me one time, she's like, Richard, when you walk through the office, you need to smile more. I was like, I need to smile more. And she's like, yeah. And this is I'm talking this is like 20 years ago. Yeah. She's like, yeah, you, you know, she's like, like it or not, you're a big dude. People notice you and smile and it'll have it and it will uh, just have an impact on somebody's day. And I was like, OK. Yeah, and so people, sometimes Richard, it's just you're a, a big simple saucy. Can't walk smile. around with a mean mug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> Uh, it's like Gandhi said, it, Richard. Gandhi said, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. Yes. Now, we're almost out of time, but I, I'm looking at your shirt. Should I should I add a What the Truck Hawaiian shirt to the WTT gear shop? I 100% want to be the first customer All if right. that happens, because I would rock that all day long. 
<laughs> Richard, how do people rock you? How do people find you on social media and how do they find Diligent? Okay, well, easy to find on LinkedIn. Um, of course, you can always hit us up at Diligent, DiligentUSA.com and, uh, or my email, rsharp at DiligentUSA.com and we'll be glad to help you. And uh, well, again, I'd appreciate the opportunity here. Richard, love you, man. Thank you to you and your team. Take care. Have an awesome day. We'll catch you down the road. By the way, follow me on Twitter at Timothy Junior. That's D at double O N E R or across social media. Find the show wherever you get podcasts. Sirius XM's Road Dog Truck and Channel 146 or FreightWaves.com. Take care. Don't be a stranger.